at different times. Um, so I'm an alumni of Triple IDB. I was I graduated in 2018, and um, yeah, I, I had the opportunity to participate in the World Finals at the ICPC twice in 2017 and 18, and I worked for two years at Google Research. So. Uh, Let's see how this goes. Let's see what questions you all have, and uh, I'll try to answer uh, answer them to the best of my ability. So, uh, other questions on the slide, or okay. So if I could somehow restart my CP journey, how would I do it? And what path or course would I suggest to someone who's just getting started? Um, if you're just getting started, I think the first thing you should do is um, do take, take part in some contest. There are a lot of uh, programming competition websites out there right now. There is Code Forces, Code Chef, stuff like that. Um, if you're just getting started, before you do anything else, just, just log into one site, register, make an account, and, and take part in a live contest. Uh, and just see how it feels, you know, um, taking part in a contest with thousands of people that try to solve the same problem you're doing, see if you like it, see if you're enjoying it, and see if the kind of problems you're doing appeal to you. Um, that's what I think someone, a uh, beginner should start with. Uh, if you think you enjoy this kind of stuff and you want to, you know, become better at it and take part in bigger competitions and win prizes, then uh, you can start on... Uh, you should start by solving uh, problems from various uh, archival judge, judges, such as a spear on light judge, called, also known as Podge. And um, you can sort the problems over there by most frequently solved and start doing, you know, the most 10 or, 30, 10, 20 or 30 of them and see how you feel. If you like it, uh, feel free to try more and, uh, you know, get better at it. Maybe give a shot of the world finals. If you don't like it, then just move on. It doesn't mean that, uh, it does, it's not necessarily a, a something that everyone likes. So, uh, yeah, that's what I would say. I guess you can see me now. So, what are some realistic monthly or yearly goals that can be achieved that will increase the probability of qualifying to the world finals? Uh, it depends on what stage you're in again. If um, if you're just getting started or you're a beginner, uh, I, I think regardless of where, which stage you're at, um, a, month, a good monthly goal can be just the number of problems you practice in a month. Um, if you're... Uh, uh, really, uh, you're just starting certain in your beginner. You should uh, try to solve the diff two A or diff two B level of problems on code forces. Uh, and you should target, you know, thirty or fifty per month. Um, they're pretty easy. You can easily do one in a one in one per day. Um, they take 15, 20 minutes max. If you are a really serious competitor and uh, you think you have a shot at the world finals, you should uh, again aim for thirty a day, which means uh, on average one really hard problem per day and. You can take up to an hour per day, but I think everyone can make time for it. Uh, on In terms of a yearly goal, uh, your goal should definitely be to improve in actual live competitions, improve your performance over there. Um, or on, on, another way to measure that is uh, uh, make a goal to improve, improve your rating on uh, different online judges like Code Forces or Code Chef. And uh, if you Consist consistently set those goals and keep setting the goals higher and higher for uh, the next month or the next year, uh, you can have a good shot at participating in the World Finals. Yeah, next. The yeah, next question. Okay. So what are your tips for practicing as a team? From when did you start preparing seriously for ICPC and what was your preparation strategy? Uh, so I started I seriously started computer programming in my second year. Actually, we were introduced to it, uh, introduced to it by our uh, teaching assistant Vivek Yadav, and uh, um, we formed a team. We thought we were, we were really serious, and we formed a team and gave our regionals in uh, October 2014. And I think we were only able to solve one out of five problems, and we were nowhere close to even qualifying for the next round. I think that's when uh, we really got serious and decided that. Uh, for the next year, we at least want to become good enough to qualify for the regionals. So that's when I started. 
Um, and actually, it's a good question uh, because practicing as a team for ICPC is very different from practicing for uh, competitions on your own. Mainly because um, when you're practicing as a team and the actual competitions, you only have one computer computer to use, and that's actually your most valuable resource. And because you have fixed time, you have to decide how to manage the resource. So it leads to interesting strategies where um, you have to communicate well with your teammates. For for example, if you, if someone is solving a particular problem on the computer, somebody else is trying another problem, and if the person trying to solve the problem hits a bug, do you let that person continue and you know debug the solution on the computer, or do you print out the problem statement on the code and debug offline while somebody else has another problem? So this can lead to interesting dynamics, and uh, the best way to practice as a team is to um, Take some of the problem sets from the past competitions, sit together. Uh, I mean, it's not possible now because of all the restrictions. But in ideal cases, sit on one table, uh, simulate the same setup as uh, you would have in the actual competition, and uh, try to solve the competition um, as if you're actually giving it. Yeah. yeah so the next few questions are on research. On sorry, okay. Research. Cool. So what are the differences uh, that are there in the academic research and industrial research and how true is the common notion about restricted freedom in industrial research uh, this is a funny question it depends from domain to domain domain um specifically in machine learning and deep learning uh, the trend has changed in quite a few years um ideally what would happen is academic research is uh, definitely less restricted because you can work on anything you want. Um, it really depends on who you're working with, on who your collaborators are, or if you're doing a PhD, what your thesis advisor advises you. Uh, and typically in the industry, research was more oriented towards the products, which means uh, if you're working on Microsoft, then Microsoft would say, hey, work on research that is useful in our products. Uh, but now um, in deep learning uh, or machine learning or AI in general, there is this weird trend where people are doing whatever the hell they want in the industry too. They are not tied to it. Not, not, it's not true in all companies, but at least the big ones. Um, it's not necessary that your work is directly applicable to some product. So, uh, with respect to AI, this notion is not too right right now. Um, will it continue to be true? I don't know because if you think about it, um, if I was a business owner, I would really question why I'm spending so much money on these extremely expensive uh, research scientists. Who was doing all this research, which is never going to be applicable for anything that my company does? Um, the large companies have a big budget to blow on these things, and um, and um, uh, they can they are they're in a sort of competition now because uh, currently the amount of research that these companies do is uh, used indirectly as marketing by saying, "Hey, look, our company has published so many papers at these top conferences." This means that our AI machine learning tools are really good. So they've gone into some kind of competition that who can publish more. But I don't know how long this trend will last. So uh, in in most fields, um, yes, there is a difference. Uh, industrial research has less freedom than ac academic freedom. But uh, for a, for a time being, and uh, I don't know for how many more years in the future, uh, at least in AI and deep learning, in the big companies, um, uh, you pretty much have the same freedom, or almost the same freedom as you would have in academia. Next question. So, how's the work culture at Google Brain? Uh, what's your day-to-day -day work like, and what exactly is your research about? The culture, uh, the culture is very similar to Google's work culture overall. Like uh, the way people work is similar to how people work in different orgs as well. Uh, it is pretty open. You can, you can. Uh, send an email to pretty much anybody else working at Google and get their questions answered, which is fun because many a times the people working there are uh, the same people who actually wrote the textbooks that you read in college. So uh, yeah, the culture is fun and uh, everyone's really approachable. Um, my day to day, my day to day work was, uh, how do I say this? Uh, so 90% of my time in the day on an average day was spent in software engineering. Uh, in machine learning and deep learning, even though you're in a research role, uh, the majority of your day will be spent writing code, debugging stuff, and uh, making more improvements to it and maintaining it. And 10% of your time is actually spent meeting with people, discussing ideas, doing research, or reading papers. 
uh, with respect to what my exact research is, uh, I worked on a couple of things. Uh, but broadly, the area I worked in can be described as machine learning for systems, which means um, can you can you apply modern deep learning techniques or machine learning techniques to optimize systems? And this can mean stuff like algorithm selection, where it's like um, you have a particular problem and there are diff many different heuristics that are applicable to the problem. And instead of picking a single one as the best heuristic to use, you use machine learning to class classify which algorithm would be the best one to use depending on the context of the problem or the, depending on the context of the application. So that's one area where I worked on. But the more cool thing that I worked on was uh, a moonshot project in which uh, the team is trying to create an artificial mathematician and they're trying to create uh, a deep learning model that can prove mathematical theorems automatically. Uh, so that's a pretty cool project that you're doing and they're making uh, big progress over that. Uh, yeah. What is the entire process behind one of your publications as to what the pipeline looks like in industrial research from identifying a problem to working on it and finally presenting a solution? Uh, there's no one process. I mean, it depends from person to person, team to team. Um, I can't speak for everybody, but in my case, uh, there were two kinds of processes. One was somebody working in some team had some idea that we should try a particular thing. They had a hypothesis and somehow they came into contact with the people I was working with and uh, we decided to collaborate because it's an interesting hypothesis test out. Um, in other cases, uh, you have published a paper and you realize that you can generalize the results from your first paper to a new paper and you come up with a new hypothesis. So that's, those are two ways we have come up with hypothesis. And uh, after that, you read up a lot of the literature. You find out what are the, what are the current results in this field and um, just do general research to figure out if a hypothesis is, uh, is valid, if, if there's any, any refutation of your hypothesis, stuff like that. After that, you decide um, uh, a goal. You, you basically have to establish a benchmark that you should beat to establish that a hypothesis is true. And you design the experiments and the infrastructure and the code you need to run those experiments, change those models and stuff like that. And once you have the results, you have to run the correct ablation experiments and um, uh, just make sure that the results are rigorous enough before you can play, uh, begin writing a paper and choose a venue where you want to publish. Um, in the middle of that, you will have various steps where you would talk to other people, show them preliminary results, get more feedback from them. If things are not working right, you find the right guy to talk to, uh, get more feedback, and uh, it's it's pretty free flowing. But uh, there's there's no uh, textbooks which you have to follow for uh, publishing paper. But uh, yeah, that's a general workflow that I was involved in. Uh, next, working with people like Oriol Vineyard. With immersed experience and expertise, what role does a newcomer play in their lab or research projects? Oh, this is funny because, uh, yeah, I have I have a publication in which um, Oriol is listed as a co-author along with me, but I have never met Oriol and we have never uh, worked with him directly. Um, and this is true in many research labs where usually the last author is uh, not an active author and is just the head of the department under which you're working at. So. Um, a weird question. Uh, in general, in 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 lot of these in large in the large industrial departments or even in academia, the senior researchers are not very really hands on. They are uh, more like advisors, where there is some team lead and uh, the team lead is talking back and forth and uh, giving feedback or update to the to the head. In case in this case, sorry all. And uh, if you have a paper because he was the boss of the guy um, who was leading the project, his name comes on it too. Uh, but in general, um, the role you play is uh, very much active. You will be coming up with a lot of hypotheses or hy alternate hypotheses. Um, you will be writing most of the code and running most of the experiments. And uh, yeah, playing an active role in the team. You will be talking to a lot of people, discussing ideas and stuff like that. Are you planning on doing a doctorate? If yes, how do people make the switch from industry into research? Okay. Uh, no, I'm not planning on a PhD. Um, I have 
come to the conclusion that it's not something for me so uh, i'm not going to pursue it anytime soon um so i don't know if i can answer the second question but i know people i know i know some of my peers are planning to switch, switch into a phd so um it is not unheard of I'm, it doesn't mean that uh, what i do is the norm but uh, yeah i'm not planning on a doctorate any general pointers as to how to get into industrial research what sort of profile should we build is masters or phd a must for industrial research uh well the ideal most of the people that i saw at google who were working in research scientist roles the majority of them had phds and this has been the norm for the majority of the people working in these kind of roles they have phds in a relevant field and they have entered into it uh how are there are ex- exceptions and uh, um this is what actually makes the a residency program the program which i i actually started at google with was unique was because uh, they were giving the opportunity to people who were not phd to actually start these so uh, as long as such programs exist you don't need a phd to uh, enter into the industrial position at the same time uh, uh, you can actually enter into research research departments of companies are software engineers you don't have to um, actually have a phd in those cases and many a times despite the role saying you're a software engineer your your day to day work ends up being a lot of research because you have to run the experiments and you have to get a lot of understanding of the papers and the research behind whatever experiment you're running so uh, if you just want to do the work that you want to that your people do in uh, these industrial research departments it doesn't matter if you have a phd or not um what sort of profile is to build a uh, I I don't know how to answer that because I guess I guess the most typical profile is someone who has a PhD in a relevant field and has published uh, papers over there uh, in good conferences and uh, um, usually done uh, PhD internships in in whatever company they want to work in for a couple of years and then made contacts and switched over. Yeah. being in google ai what is the future of ai machine learning and deep learning look like well if i knew what the future would look like it would not be the future anymore but uh, uh it's a weird question i think there are there are pros and cons um some of the pros are that uh, we are we're definitely making progress it's probably not as uh, drastic as the progress that we were seeing uh, earlier in the decades when machine learning and deep learning just no deep learning just became popular uh but we're definitely seeing progress and techniques are still um, improving and we are applying these techniques into domains that have never been applied to before and uh, we're definitely seeing that these techniques are uh, often better than the traditional techniques on the cons um i'm worried about the scale at which these are uh, the, these techniques have been run on and uh, specifically the ability that small research labs will be able to do the same kind of experiments that these large companies like google or deepmind are being able to do because uh, i mean i mean think about gpt3 right it cost millions of dollars to train just one model and i don't think i'm the majority of phd students don't have the budget in their academic labs to be actually actually able to um do experiments at that scale which uh, leads to two interesting problems right one is um, do these large tech companies become the gate gatekeepers of science in this case because um if you cannot reproduce the research that they're doing is it really research i mean um how do you verify that the results that they published actually true or not and um number two they can have a monopoly on it if if they're actually right it means that uh, it become increasingly hard for small competitors to compete against them so yeah there are both pros and cons it's still an exciting field because uh, um i think the research side is getting a bit more stagnated but people are still finding more interesting applications on the practical side so um i i have mixed feelings about what the future holds that's what i would say uh, what was the process of getting into google research and what should a good application look like is it necessary for a candidate to have papers published in ml or uh, be an acm icpc world finalist so again um I didn't get directly into Google research. I got into a program called the AI Residency, uh, which was willing to accept people who didn't have PhD and stuff like that. In fact, people from non-traditional backgrounds. Uh, so in my case, uh, no, I did not have any papers before I applied. Um, 
so i think the only thing that helped me stand out was me being an icpc finalist because among the other peers in my cohort i don't think there was any other finalist there were other people um, who had gold medals or uh, silver medals in this math and bits of like that but uh, i think icpc helped me but no it's not necessary that you have to be a world finalist to be there because there were uh, uh, way more people who were not world finalists at google than people who are um about getting into google research without the residency most of the people i have seen do that uh, uh have phd's however that doesn't mean that you don't you need a phd because uh, on the other extreme you have people who never even went to college they are college dropouts and uh, they were homeschooled and then some i don't know what exactly the route was but the most prominent of them is uh, i think chris ola who is actually a senior research scientist now at google and he dropped out of college so um yeah it is possible to get into these programs without phd's too but uh, yeah i don't think there's any ideal profile i think um obviously having relevant experience will help but uh, there is no uh, single process of getting into it you just need to um have something relevant on your resume or uh, maybe go to a conference uh, pick get a hold of one of these guys working at the conference talk to them and show them that your experience is relevant and uh, see if they have an opening for you that's what i would say okay so we have a few random questions next okay since you have done cp and research what are the skills from cp that you think are helpful for research and do you think that if one is good at cp then they can be good at research oh well, good question um interesting question uh yeah actually the most useful thing from cp that uh, so 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 for context again uh, 90% of your work in at least deep learning research comes down to good software engineering because of the complexity of these models and uh, the pipelines that we're talking of um, it becomes really hard to manage if you're not a good software engineer um, uh, it's it's especially because it's really hard to maintain code so uh, the the most uh, the direct most directly relevant skill from cp would be uh, the coding skills itself the better you are at coding the easier time you'll have over there uh, although there are some cons as well for example um, in cp most of the problems that you're working on are generally solved in a few minutes maybe a few hours but in research these same problems that you're trying to solve can take months um so in that way cp rewards uh, short term behavior like like uh, give incentivizes uh, rewards in the short term so it's uh, i've seen many of uh, me and my other friends in cp get uh, you know impatient we really want to see uh, results of our efforts really soon and that's not really useful for research but um yeah so th there are definitely some skills that are applicable and helpful for research in fact uh, in a couple of cases uh, i was i had to use dynamic programming to uh, actually be able to do my research because uh, the analysis of my experiment would be intractable 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 if i did it uh, through brute force but it was tractable tractable because i was able to the uh, reformulate the problem as dp and uh, definitely my uh, being able to do uh, definitely being a good at cp help in that um do i think that if one is good at cp they can be good at research i mean why not i don't see any problem over there like i said there are pros and cons but uh, uh, is, is there a correlation if you're really good at cp are you good at research probably um, but um, yeah I, i don't have anything much more to comment on that How does your CGPA weigh in when you move along your career, both in industry and research? Uh, short answer is it doesn't matter at all. I mean, no one gives a shit about it. Think of it like your your twelfth board exams. I mean, everyone said it's important, and nobody gives a shit how much you scored in twelfth boards. Um, in some cases, CGPA does matter. I think, unfortunately, it does matter. I wish it did not, but. Um, when you are uh, applying to phd programs in grad school they i think they do check your cgpa and um, i think if you are applying for your first ever job straight out of college and you are on on campus placements uh, it does become a criteria because uh, they want to filter students and rank them and you know pick the best ones and sometimes uh, they don't have any other metric except for your gpa so 
it does make a difference but uh, i don't think it matters at all once you get i mean no one at google has ever asked me what my gpa was after I, once i started working there so and that's just that's true for any other company too so um, i would say it doesn't matter at all even if you have a bad gpa now maybe you will have some difficulty with phd programs or um, getting into your first job but i know people uh, from my batch who have uh, found their ways around it and uh, they have they managed to get what they wanted so i uh, it's the least important thing how would you prioritize between cp and academics any college specific remarks or tip i mean, again it, all these questions depend on what the person want right so if if you really want to go to the world finals you'll have to give uh, much greater priority to cp right you'll have to put in a lot more hours into that than any other person but uh, if you're someone who wants to go into good phd program and uh, you know then you need to maintain really good cgpa and then you have to uh, put a lot more focus in academics so there is there is no really there's no one answer for me i wanted to prioritize on cp so i spent a lot more time on cp um college specific tips uh, i think one thing that i wish more people object electives and reading electives especially um, try to take both your pe and re in one sem under the same professor because uh, one they give you a lot of freedom uh, you don't have any fixed timings for your classes or anything so you get a lot of free time in your uh, in the end of week and they're much more open ended so that means you can explore things a lot and uh, you get a lot more attention from the professor as well um uh, so you you're knocking two birds out of one stone right because you get getting um, you're doing your pe and re in something you actually like and at the same time you have more spare time in your uh, in your week to do uh, other things that you want to explore What was your Google selection procedure, and how much was your CGPA in second year? I don't remember what my CG was in the second year, and uh, the Google selection procedure. Again, I applied. I joined to the Google AI residency, so you you go to Google Twitter page, you apply, you send your resume, and then they ask you for more stuff. In my case, they ask for. uh letters of recommendation and uh, and a statement of purpose it was very similar to how you apply for a phd actually and after that they shortlisted us and i had a couple of interviews yeah my cg i don't know is my next question man- is even management useful later if i work in some committee or club will these things help us in industry um so uh if you by, if by helpful you mean does saying that i was a volunteer at spandan help in your resume no if you mean um do the skills you acquire while doing these kind of things uh, are they relevant to what you do on your job uh, definitely because if you're working in clubs and committees what you're doing is basically dealing with people you're learning how to work with people work in teams and basically organize and run large projects um and that's definitely useful right because what you're doing in the industry is basically working with people you have to manage people there you have to manage your relationship with your boss with your with your teammates and uh, with the people reporting to you so um yeah i think it should be useful uh, especially if you're organizing uh, the bigger events like the tedx talks and stuff like that so yeah if 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 you if you are interested in a particular event and you want to get a hands on and try to manage them then go for it it's a useful soft skill in fact you'll be surprised how many people um, are uh, scared to make cold clo- cold calls so uh, it's a useful thing to learn uh we have the last question uh when did you start with cp in your second year or third year and what was your grade in dsa in your first year yeah so i started in my second year uh, which means if if you start uh, in your first year you already have a one year lead over whatever we had so that's really an advantage and i don't know what my grade in dsa was i have to check that transcript but like why is this question even relevant i mean uh, in think about it i am i thought there will be more questions related to cp and stuff like that and uh, i don't i i mean like i come for an aim and this is the best question you could come up with so <laughs> i just find it funny yeah uh, you said this is the last question just random <laughs> 
Yeah, uh, is this the last question, or like, do you want to uh, try taking questions from the chat or something? Is that it, or are we taking questions from the chat or something? So, if the audience want uh, to ask some questions, I think they can type it out in the chat box. Okay, so I have received some private. Question: Can you tell how a third-year student should go about CP for for interview and coding rounds and interviews, and how are the questions asked uh, in interviews like Div two, C, and D? Uh, so hmm. if you if you if you only want to do CP to clear interviews, so so yeah, it's it's it, there, there's no secret over there. The questions that you're asked in these programming and software engineering interviews and jobs are very similar to the questions that you asked on CP. So if you're good at CP, it helps you in uh, job interviews. If you just want to do it to uh, crack the coding round, um, then um, you don't need to go very deep. In fact, most of the coding interviews uh, questions are way, way, way easier than they are in uh, these programming competitions. In fact, I have uh, rarely seen any question get harder than div 2 c Even div 2 c is there, in fact. Um, most of the uh, standard questions that have been asked over and over and over again, and you'll find them on Geeks for Geeks. So if you do the standard questions on Geeks for Geeks, you're in good shape. And if you can solve Div 2 C questions consistently on Code Forces, uh, you are 99% ready for most interviews. Some of the harder places to get in do ask Div 2 D, but it's rare. So. Um, I mean, Div2D questions are harder too. It's a lot more investment than Div2C. So, uh, unless you're ready to invest a lot of time in asking these kind of questions, uh, don't worry beyond Div2C. Okay. Uh, the rate of improvement in CP is very low. How did you stay motivated? So, uh, it's simple. I like CP. Um, I, I definitely remember giving my first contest and seeing that. Uh, there were five problems in the, in the contest and uh, I think I did the first one and I wasn't able to do the second one in the next two hours. And when you check the leaderboard later on, you realize that there are people who have solved, there are people from Russia and China who are five years younger than you who have solved all five problems uh, in 20 minutes. So <laughs> it's a pretty sobering experience because uh, uh, you get to see where you stand and uh, that kind of motivated me. I thought, uh, why am I not able to solve problems at the same rate and these kids can, right? So yeah, the 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 simple answer is I enjoyed doing CP and uh, I enjoyed learning about the problems that, you, that, that I was solving and the new concepts that I'm learning, uh, which is how I just remained motivated. And eventually I saw progress too. I saw that I was able to solve harder questions that I was able to solve for. My rank and the contest was improving, and uh, that's just additional motivation. Yeah. If I, how to work if I don't have a good maths background from school? Uh, I, you don't need to have a very good maths background. In fact, uh, I don't think I did very well in my JE mains. I think I think maths was my weakest among the three uh, subjects in JE. So. Uh, don't be, I, I think anybody can pick it up, just start from the basics, pick up the easiest problems, go through them one by one. Um, and you'll see, you, you'll eventually pick up the concepts, the mathematical concepts that you need to solve problems. If you specifically want to work on maths, you can uh, try um, uh, solving problems on this on this platform called Project Euler, where they have, they don't have programming problems, they just have maths problems, but many of them can only be solved if you write code for that. So. You, uh, it's a very active community. They have uh, very, very active forums. You can try sol solving problems on that and see the discussions that people are having over there and what concepts they have used. <laughs> I get depressed after some drift around in CF. You're not alone, man. I think uh, it's easy to get depressed right? because you are spending two hours solving a single problem and there, there's some kid in China who's in the fifth standard and he solved all five problems in 15 minutes. So you can, you can, you can get depressed, but uh, I mean, you have to start from somewhere. And if you're at the bottom, it's, it's fine. Like it, it doesn't just because you last doesn't mean that you can't improve. So just uh, start doing some practice, uh, practice the simplest problems or try this thing called the ladders on A2OJ. 
and you will definitely see improvement everybody will see improvement uh, how important how important is it to have good connections with seniors to get a good placement uh, none it can help if you know some seniors and they can give you referrals it will help you but uh, you don't need connections with any seniors like uh, that's not going to give you any significant advantage even a referral all the referral is going to do is get you an interview i mean you have to do well in the interview to clear and get the job so it will help you a bit but not much uh how do you feel about ai research in india do you think it would be possible to carry out a good career in ai and ml domain in india wait where that question go okay i don't know some question just disappeared uh, so basically what do you feel about ai research in india do you think it would be possible to carry out a good career in ai and ml domain in india or should we try moving to us or europe uh why not i mean we must be reading in the news about all these new research labs coming up in fact google itself set up uh, the first ever research lab in india so um yeah you can have a good career over you don't need to go out the only advantage um so only difference is it's not between india and uh, uh, abroad it's more of a co- big companies and big companies and academia because uh, the these big companies have uh, a lot of resources so they have a lot of infrastructure and, and basically infinite number of gpus to run these last large, large machine learning experiments and academia in most places does not and since most of these large companies are based in the us it looks like careers in the us are better but uh, india is catching up and uh, there are plenty of ai startups coming about so you can try working there and make a good career over there uh, so no it's not necessary to leave uh, india for a good career over there things are just picking up over here in fact it's more exciting in india than it is outside india right now being in mtech and studying online is making the academic schedule very very hectic how should i manage my time for cp in such schedule uh i don't know <laughs> so i i don't know what the mtech schedule was in that i think the mtechs are in a in a different position because for mtechs uh, you'll have a lot more courses in the first sem compared to imtechs so i, I can't specifically comment on what to do i think uh, in my case the way i did it was uh, uh, i bunk lectures basically i stop i didn't attend classes that i didn't enjoy i decided i'll just mug up shit and write the exam whenever i wanted to and use the time i save from the lectures on uh, on uh, cp that's what i did and later on i um took project lectures and reading the lectures which we did more time uh uh one second um start by start by you know doing maybe one problem a day see if you can always just set aside a time saying that between 10 and 11 pm i'll just do one problem and then get get it done with see if that lets you get into a rhythm but yeah i'm not going to comment more on that that's uh, beyond my pay grade how much did you manage the time you dedicate in development and cp this thing is killing me now it was very simple for me i th- i just wanted to go go to the world final so i just gave as much time as i could to cp so uh for me it, it, it was not uh, really uh, a difficult decision between two things i just wanted one thing uh the way i made more time was by uh, choosing my subjects wisely for example uh, there are some subjects uh, or some courses which you take in lectures which are uh, basically a free a grade if you know if you good in cp because they are the same thing so um um yeah pick the courses wisely that can help you uh but yeah if i have to give you better advice i'll have to get into you know specifics about what your background is or what your context is but yeah i can't know beyond that what should i do to prioritize as i have less time as compared to i, I am like Yeah, so the MTechs are in a weird situation, right? Because uh, compared to IMTech, you have just two years. In fact, I wouldn't say you have even two years. You have just one year because you have one year of courses and then placements start, and everyone has to optimize whatever they're doing for placements. And um, 
so it's definitely a challenge and i think um until then unless some people in mtech have done computer programming in their btech itself they are definitely going to have difficulty picking it up compared to imtechs but uh, again i can't specifically comment because i don't know the program structure completely but try, try the same thing i said try a one problem a day uh, pick up some online judge sort the problems that are most frequently solved and do one problem a day and make your work your way down and see uh, if you able to do it in the beginning uh, most problems should be uh, you, you can solve most problems in an hour in fact some of them even 15 minutes so see if you can pick up rhythm and uh, keep it going good resources for dynamic programming uh hmm i think you should ask i, I don't i don't remember the exact resources now you can start with the standard problems that they that they ask in uh, on on geeks for geeks for interviews and stuff like that or or in the standard problems uh, from your dsa i think you'll have to ask uh, some of the people in camp right now uh, i think uh, maybe raghavan or uh, or aditya shet because uh, they are going to be more into what are the best resources for that yeah just just ask some of the the club members in camp and they should be able to help you Yeah, Core Forces was uh, my the main website on which I tried CP. Uh, it was definitely useful. Um, what if someone is interested towards development than CP? Can one prioritize it more than CP? I mean, of course, you don't have to do CP. There are so there are way more many people who uh, don't do CP at college and those who do. So you don't have to do CP to do anything. I mean. Even at Google, ninety-nine point nine percent of the people who are working over there have never even heard of computer programming. So no, you don't have to do it. What are the key things other than problem practice do we have to do in IC, ACM, ICPC? Um, uh, there is nothing else. You just practice problems, learn new concepts, and get better. Uh, Yeah, I'm not going to answer the questions about CGPA anymore, man. CGPA is dumb. I'm skipping all CGPA questions, please. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> How to go about preparing for interviews? Um, I'm not the best person to ask because I just did CP, and it turns out that CP is actually useful for uh, for interviews. So you can do what I did. You can try to you know just become really good at CP, and then you it'll turn out that interviews are really easy for you. Um, If uh, if you don't care about CP too much and you just want to clear, do it for uh, interviews, then just pick up the science resources like Geeks or Geeks, Lead Code, and uh, start doing problems on that. And uh, the more problems you do on that, the better you'll get. In fact, on some sites you can find uh, the questions that have been asked in past interviews of companies. You can start with that too. Uh, the scrolling in this thing is weird. It just keeps going up. uh hang on where where was i okay don't think i have to answer question i skip some and go to the good ones how do you manage time okay again i'm skipping that um i answered that uh I'm in the third year. Is it too late starting to start preparing for ICPC? Um, no. Uh, you can start preparing. Obviously, you're going to have a disadvantage because there'll be some people in the college who have started a year or two before that. So they're going to be ahead of you, and you might feel a bit of pinch because they're going to be better at you than it initially. But that doesn't mean you can work hard. You can't work harder and uh, what is it? Non-Google job in India to Google job shift. Any tips? Apply online and. Uh, Yeah, if your resume gets selected, you're in. I don't know what other tips to give. And yeah, that's it. Like, apply online. There's no secret. Uh, are the maths courses from semesters important? Did they help in any way? Uh, yeah, some of the topics that came up over there were actually useful in CP. But more often than not, uh, uh, it happened that uh, is for example in the discrete maths course the things i learned in cpu were actually helpful and they made discrete maths easier for me so yeah it goes both ways is google stadia dead uh, i don't know <laughs> uh, how to manage a gift time distribution okay 
Uh, same thing. I'm not going to answer any more time management questions. I think they're too specific from a, for a person to person. Now, I can't give an advice to everybody for that. If advanced algorithms, wait, which was the ad advanced algorithm? Was it the one, the elective or the, okay, I don't know what course that was. So I, I can't, I can't answer that. I don't remember it. Uh, any other hacks like reading elective and project elective? Um, become friends with Mulli, sir. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, um, avoid mess food. Yeah, the uh, the more you eat over there, the more sick you get. And uh, how do you keep track of the things you learn? I don't know. I, I I learn things. I forget them. I learn them again. Um, there's no specific way I keep track of them. Uh, we just got started with them. And any tips and resources how to improve? Uh, take part in Kaggle. Like uh, rather than doing the theory, it's uh, much more useful if you if you uh, start doing the actual competitions on Kaggle and uh, see what it's like in practice. Because uh, in practice, you do all these weird tricks that have no theoretical backing in them. And unless you do that, uh, uh, you're not going to learn machine learning or ML. Uh, yeah, basically, be, be, uh, do practical projects or stuff like that. Is that it? Or have I missed some questions? I think that's the last question, right? Uh, can you hear me? Saad? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I, guess I guess we can, we can wrap, wrap it up. Okay. So, thanks for taking the time. time. Yeah. Um, to us. Uh, this was the first event of DSE Club. And we had, had many interesting, interesting questions today. today. Uh, we, we hope, hope that, that all of your doubts are covered. And we have many such interesting events lined up. So follow us on LinkedIn and Instagram to get more updates on the upcoming events. Thank you all for joining us and good night. Yeah, so thanks for having me and uh, yeah, you had some fun questions. So thanks, take care, all the best and stay safe. Bye-bye.